Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's Saturday webinar for Saturday, April 2nd, 2022. This is the fourth in our five-episode series on populist and progressives for spring 2022, and today's topic was democracy, republicanism, and changing views on limited government and the separation of powers. We were joined, as always, by our moderator, Dr. Chris Burkett of Ashland University, and panelists, Dr. Scott Yenner of Boise State and Dr. John Dynan of Wake Forest. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about our programs, our resources, and our documents collections at tah.org. So welcome, everybody, to another teachingamericanhistory.org Saturday webinar sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. TAH is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett. I, I teach here at, uh, at Ashland University, and I'm also the director of the Ashbrook Scholar Program for undergraduate students here at Ashland University. Uh, for our webinar series this spring, in case you're joining us for the first time, we're drawing inspiration from our Ashbrook uh, Populist and Progressives Documents Collection, which was edited by Jason Jividen. And you can access all of those documents in this collection for free online at tah.org, or you can purchase them in paperback format for a very low price. Um, the point of these webinars is to bring together some interesting, lively, thoughtful scholars and have a conversation about important things. And we encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions in the Q&A feature. And as always, we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. In the next week, you'll receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation and a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. So today our topic is democracy, republicanism, and changing views on the separation of powers. And I'm very honored to welcome as panelists today Scott Yetter of Boise State University and John Deenan of Wake Forest University. Thanks both of you for being here today. Been looking forward to seeing you both and talking about this, uh, this topic. So um, let me see here if I can uh, start off with the, I'll start off with a broad question and then you all, you know how this goes. You just start impressing us with your, with your brilliance and thoughtfulness from here. So, so the topic today is democracy and republicanism and then their separation of powers. And I think they're interrelated, and I'm sure we'll sort of cover how those things are interrelated in our conversation. But can you start by talking a little bit about um, what, what is the difference in the minds of progressives between a republic and a democracy? Uh, progressives really start to use that term, it seems to me, democracy, democratic, democracy, much more than we probably had previous in our history, although I may be wrong about that. So so why are, they, why are they emphasizing democracy over republicanism and, and maybe what might the difference be in their minds? John, do you wanna start? Sure, I'm glad to do that. And thanks for uh, letting me be a part of this. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion. These are such a rich set of readings that we have today. And it's such a rich period in American political development. Here's the way I would start us off. The, and I would do this by contrasting the founders, the framers of the U.S. Constitution with the progressives that we read about today. The progressives that we read today, their view of democracy and republicanism is as follows. In their view, there is public opinion and is, public opinion should be expressed as directly and immediately as possible. And in their view, anything that stands in the way of, that influences the reflection of public opinion into governing is standing in the way of the people. There's the will of the people, and then there's the will of special interests in elites. And so you, this comes out in J. Allen Smith. He says, well, uh, there's, there's the democratic will, and then there's efforts to stand in the way of democratic will, such as indirect representation or separation of powers. The founders had a very different understanding of that. The founders had an understanding of there's different ways that the public opinion can be represented. There can be the reflexive, immediate sense of the public, but then there can be the deliberative, reflective sense of public opinion. And so the founders said, yes, we definitely want to have an indirect representation rather than a direct representation, but it's not because we're against democracy. It's not because we're against public opinion. It's because we want the deliberative sense of public opinion. I'll stop for now, but that's, and as I read the progressives and, and then I read the founders, that's what strikes me 
is that the progressives have an understanding there's democracy in its purest sense, and that's what should be represented. It seems to me the framers had a much richer understanding of public opinion, that there can be public opinion in an immediate sense, and then there's public opinion, as we say, where you count to 100 and account to 1,000 and think, is that, what I, is that the best sense of what I think? The founders had that understanding of the immediate view of, of public opinion, and they wanted the more deliberative, reflective sense. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I agree with that. Uh, I'm good, right? Um, I agree with You're that. Good. I was looking at myself, I'm not muted. Uh, <laughs> You're good. So, uh, I mean, I agree with that in a general way. And, uh, and I want us to maybe think about why the progressives made, uh, you know, ma made the advance or change uh, that they did with respect to the founding. Um, so, to me, the question that uh, TR speeches, especially and uh, they think is reacting to the idea that uh, that representative government can be corrupted by what he calls special interests. So that there's been some sort of capture in his view that has happened at the level of representative government so that it is no longer deliberative, but rather uh, uh, oligarchic and, uh, and, and serving the interests of, uh, of not the people, but rather uh, these special interests. And then th they, space, they, they face a choice. How do we uncorrupt government's institutions? Do we go below the government to the people and appeal to democratic interests and democratic mechanisms? Or do we go above the people, uh, above the, uh, uh, you know, the, the corrupt institutions and try to afford some sort of constitutional change? And their answer is, we're gonna try to do both. Um, we're gonna in, in, implement constitutional changes in order to empower the people to uncorrupt, if I can use that word, the institutions. So uh, when you look at uh, TR's new nationalism speech, um, and I know that everyone has this available to them, um, he, he really frames it in this way. I mean, it's kind of incredible what he says here. Um, there's a paragraph, uh, I see how far down it is. Maybe it's about a third of the way down. Uh, the paragraph begins with the word at many stages. So at many stages, uh, T.R. writes or says, in the advance of humanity, this conflict between the man who possesses more than they have earned and the man who have mer earned more than they possess is the central condition of progress. Lay that aside for a second. In our day, it appears as the struggle of free men to gain and hold the right of self-government as against the special interests who twist the methods of free government into machinery for defeating the popular will. That's the corruption. At every stage and under all circumstances, the essence of the struggle is to equalize opportunity, destroy privilege, and to give the life and citizenship of every individual the highest possible value both to himself and to the commonwealth. This is nothing new. Here's my favorite line. All I ask in civil life is what you fought for in the civil war. <laughs> uh, right. And, um, so, so I think, you know, and when we think about the, these progressive democratic populists, we have to like we have to look at their theories, and that's what uh, John's answer uh, did. And then, but we also I think have to think about how the institutions of representative government can be corrupted, and what to do about it in any particular circumstance. Um, I think we can debate whether or not the corruption that the progressives were reacting to was real, um, but I think that's also really part of their theory. Yeah, that's great. Thanks uh, from both of you. Great start to this conversation. By the way, just before we keep going with this, those that paragraph, Scott, you pointed to, and the paragraph, uh, let's see, before it, right? Um, yeah, yeah the, I just always found it interesting that he introduced the language of struggle, historical struggle, um, mm -hmm. which I know may be beyond the pale of, of what we're focusing on here, but when you frame it in the idea of a historical struggle, like a, uh, <laughs> you know, a sort of um, a dialectic of history, mm -hmm. um, I think that that you know, 
I just always found that interesting that he would do that. And that, that allows him in a certain way to make that leap, as you were pointing out earlier, that this is in essence the same thing today that we're fighting for that we fought for in the Civil War. Yeah. Right. The oligarchy has just taken a different form. So anyway, um, John, you look like you want to jump in, please. Well, I, I did because I, because Scott's comments were so rich and I wanted to pick up on them because I think that's very reasonable. The, the progressives were were reacting at the level of theoretical arguments. They were also very much reacting, as we all do in political life, to what was going on around them and what they were seeing happening in legislatures and courts. And so I think it's worth just spending a few minutes on that. What were they reacting to at that time? And I think this comes out particularly in some of Teddy Roosevelt's uh, speeches. And, and, and we should take ourselves back. Roosevelt, interestingly enough, particularly in this, uh, the right of the people to rule speech, He's reacting against a lot of things that are going on in the state government level in that way. We often times focus on the national level. And so we think of the national level, we say, well, what's going on around the progressive era? But Roosevelt's reminding us that a lot of governing, most of governing really, took place at the state level. And he said, let's take a look at what's happening. And he said, you have all this desire to regulate railroads. The railroads are seen as kind of having the, you know, a hammerlock over all kinds of, of commerce. And when legislatures try to regulate that, oftentimes the railroads were literally seen as owning certain legislators. They were saying like they, they would just corrupt them. In a literal sense, they would corrupt them by, 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 by donating so much money that they would have full control over them. You see these cartoons at the time and it's the railroad is in the back. It's like a puppet string of the legislators. And so that's what people say. They said the legislators, they won't regulate the railroads. The railroads are so powerful. And then they say, we're trying to at least take care of working people. So we want to at least have a limit on how many hours a day they can be forced to work. We want at least to be able to pay them a minimum wage. And it particularly want to have safe working conditions for them. We want to have a workers' compensation program. And it's really tough to get these through legislators because the legislators are seen as too uh, persuaded by business interests. But then, and here's where Teddy Roosevelt's speech comes in, even when the legislators and the states are passing these measures, minimum wage measures, maximum hours measures, eight hour a day and workers' compensation, then they're getting in trouble through the courts, not just the federal courts with the Lochner decision, but all kinds of state court decisions. And so you see, particularly Roosevelt is reacting to this Ives versus South Buffalo Railway case, where New York legislature had finally gotten around to passing a workers' compensation law, strongest workers' compensation law in the country. And what happens? a state court strikes it down and says, I'm sorry, you can't do that. You can see why someone like Roosevelt and other progressives are saying something's wrong with the operation of government where there's a large, uh, a, a considered public judgment that we ought to be able to protect workers, regulate railroads and other corporations, and our legislators, and then especially our courts are working against against us. And so I just wanted to put that, that, that background in there, that context, because once we see that context, we can have an appreciation, I think, for why the progressives would be led to consider some of these institutional mechanisms, such as direct democracy, the recall of public officials, putting judicial decisions to a public referendum. So I'll stop there, but that's, that's the context of, in which this is, this is, these are operating. So it's very understandable that they're willing to kind of um, stretch the envelope in terms of the institutional uh, uh, arrangements they're willing to consider. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, so there's, I think, I, I mean, I agree with all that. And I, I think it's, um, I, would, I would zoom out and think about the context uh, also in, in, the, uh, in, in partisan politics terms. I mean, the Republican Party basically had controlled most of the states in the North for two generations. Um, by the time uh, TR and uh, the other progressives are, are doing their thing as far as challenging the, the reigning orthodoxy of the Republican Party. And, uh, and you know, the, the doctrines of the party uh, you know, they kind of fade in importance over the course of time and personalities and, uh, and the attachment that the establishment has to interests uh, end up being what drives, you know, partisan considerations a lot of times. And so like you see this in, you see this in states, I mean, I'm just trying to like, 
I think there's a big theoretical thing that the progressives do, big theoretical thing. Um, and Chris was pointing to it. You know, they're re really rejecting the old understanding of human nature and the limits of politics that are embodied in the constitution. Like that's the big theoretical thing they're doing. And in, on some very important level, it's very objectionable. And we can maybe get to that. Um, on, on a practical level, they're diagnosing a kind of corrupt elite as they see it. And they might be right. I mean, uh, uh, you see this, I, I mean, I'm in Idaho, the Republicans have controlled Idaho for two generations. They no longer care about what they used to care about. And uh, old establishments are, they kind of die, they kind of get tired. Uh, they kind of mouth the words of Reagan here, but they, you know, they practice the government of Bill Clinton or something. And, um, and you know, so it, it makes sense that the Republican establishment of TRS Day, after having governed the country and most of these states that we're talking about for two generations, kind of had lost their way. And, um, and what do you do in a circumstance where an establishment has lost its way? Well, under the old idea of the Constitution, you vote them out. <laughs> and um, <Right. laughs> and, and you, you try to replace them with a new political order. Um, I mean, TR suggested fundamental constitutional amendments, uh, that is referenda, um, initiative processes to bypass the state legislatures. And, uh, you know, so to me, the efficacy of the progressives comes down to the question, was it possible for reforms to be accomplished over the, like over a decade period without undertaking this fundamental constitutional reform that they ended up suggesting. That's to me the kind of tactical or political question that you'd ask if you're just trying to figure out what the health of the regime was at that point. Yeah, those are, yeah, please, John, yeah, just go ahead, John. Can, can I just pick up here? So, I, so I'm thinking um, in, in terms of our, our participants too, I'm always thinking of for teaching purposes, how might I teach some of these documents or how to, how to introduce them in, in class? And, 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 and I'd be interested to see whether our participants, um, folks tuning in here, or whether they do uh, have already taught some of these documents, whether they're looking forward to do so. Here's, here's how I, I, I like to think about this and putting together some of the theoretical points that Scott was making in his various comments. I love to assign Federalist 10 and then assign Roosevelt's the right of the people to rule. And just to put those back to back in that sense, or at least if you're in a point where you're teaching the progressives to kind of remind folks of Federalist 10. And I say that for, for the following reason, for several reasons. Because if we take ourselves back to Federalist 10, for those of us who kind of bring it back, uh, Publius is working through, he says, what's our problem here? He says, well, there's two ways that you could have a problem. You could have a, a faction, which would be against the interests of the public. It could be a majority of the citizens, or it could be a minority of the country. And Publius quickly disposed, he says, we don't have to worry about minority faction because that'll get taken care of through the operation of Republican institutions. So he spends all of his time in Federalist 10 saying, the problem of majority faction, we could think of it as majority tyranny or, or various ways we tell it. And what Roosevelt and others are coming back and saying is, I think you might've dismissed too quickly the problem of minority faction or minority tyranny. He says, you, you said that that would be taken care of. And so we could just start talking about well, what happens when a majority loses its way or a majority is factious or a majority is opposed to the public interest. But we, in a really um, sincere way in the progressive period, have to consider the possibility that a minority faction, that is a, a, a minority of the public, could grab hold of governing institutions or could prevent a deliberative majority from acting. And so I think that's a very important challenge in some ways to Federalist 10, one of these canonical kind of kind of uh, 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 documents of, of, of American political development, political thought, to say, we don't have to worry about majority faction or tyranny, minority faction tyranny, let's go this. The progressives are putting on, well, what if we do have to worry about that? And if we do, does that require a new set of institutional arrangements or a new way of thinking that might have been too easily put to the side. 
I think I, yeah, I, and I it guess. really you know ahead, it really Scott, depends. Please. Like uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, it really does seem that there wasn't a problem of minority factions in these legislatures. I mean, all over the place, they were passing the kind of social legislation that they wanted to pass, and. Uh, I mean, the workman's compensation law gets through New York and the Lochner, you know, I, I mean, I, that, that's a different issue. I, uh, let's just stick with the workers' compensation thing. Um, you know, all of these laws are being passed by the, uh, by state legislatures. Oregon had a bunch of laws. Wisconsin had a bunch of laws. New York, New Jersey, all over the East Coast had a bunch of laws. It's like, well, on, on the one hand, nothing seems wrong with these legislatures. <laughs> they're, they're passing such regulations. Uh, the national legislature passes progressive reform that, uh, you know, 1890, it passes the first uh, uh, Sherman Act. And uh, so, you know, things are getting through. The judiciary is somewhat of a trailing indicator. It's always a trailing indicator, at least it always was uh, at, at this point in the country's history. And, uh, and, and no doubt, uh, after, you know, uh, half a generation of progressive elected officials, uh, they would have gotten many of these reforms through. Um, so, I mean, I do think that the problem of minority uh, control of these governments could be greatly overstated. Like, I think it's nothing compared to the post-1965 constitution that we have. Um, the reforms were being passed. And, um, and ultimately, I think their commitment to these things was less practical and more ideological, which you know, we, we, which we'll talk about again um, in a little bit. But, you know, just on the empirical question of whether or not the state legislatures and the government institutions in general were captured by some sort of special interest or minority interest, I think it's very much an open question. <laughs> and, uh, and we take the progressive dogma on this, um, uh, you know, as gospel. And I think it actually is very uh, much a question whether or not their empirical description of what's going on is accurate. Um, uh, I mean, I could say one more thing on that. Like the number of interest groups that existed at this time in America's governing history was nothing compared to the post-1965 dispensation that we have. Nothing. There was no K Street. And in state legislatures now, there's almost everywhere the equivalent of a K Street where you have lobbyists and such. Like there was nothing like that. <laughs> and um, so I once again, I think their practical description is very interesting. It may not have fit their time, but it's actually like something that Republican governments are subject to. Yes, I wonder, Scott, though, if they, um, the corruption that progressives are arguing exists, it's not so much from a kind of institutionalized body of interest groups, right? Or lobbying groups that we have today, but, but, um, but that it's connected somehow to the idea that, that money is influencing pol politics, money is buying candidates, candidates are elected with, you know, really under the thumbs of, of the wealthy who have somehow forced them to, you know, pledge that they're gonna resist making progressive reforms, passing progressive legislation. I mean, that's another side of the story that we get from progressives. Uh, to what extent do you guys think that that's, is that actually happening uh, to the extent that they're, that they're, uh, that they're saying, go ahead, John. Yeah, please. Well, because I, I take Scott's point, Scott's point is, well, how empirically on the ground, how much were these legislatures captured? How much were they really standing in the way of the public opinion? And I suppose it's a matter of how quickly were the legislatures acting in some ways? And I think it's in railroad regulation that this really comes up. If you go out to kind of California and read some of the political debates of the 1890s or the first part of the 1900s, they were fundamentally concerned with the railroads that were actually able to set their own rates, to discriminate on the basis of rates, and in ways that they say, these folks, who's running California? It's the Southern Pacific Railroad is, 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 is running California. We, in, 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 you know, in, in, in form, it's the legislature, but we really do see the way that these, the railroads are able to kind of donate to candidates or spend against opponents. They really are in the back. They're the ones that are in control. 
So how much to weigh, because um, it is the case in California that eventually things came to a head. And in 1911, in a really, um, first of all, um, uh, Hiram Johnson was, was elected governor. And then in 1910, in 1911, there was a huge um, outpouring of legislation where they created the initiative process, the referendum process, the recall process, and all kinds of things. So that eventually things did, were able to get hold. But I guess in the views of the progressives was, it took a long time and it shouldn't have taken so long. And even then it was halting steps. And so you do see, um, Teddy Roosevelt, he's spending a fair amount of time in his speeches talking about campaign finance reform. This is a, it, it, in that way and the need for it. I'd have to go back and, and really kind of look in detail to see to what extent um, kind of this money was being spent in, in all the legislatures, just some of the legislatures. But it, th there, there's grounds for seeing this as a real concern that is the role of money in politics in a way that really was potentially corrupting of the process. Part of, part of the reason I threw that out there, Scott, is as you were just uh, you know, pointing out, at the same time that progressives like Roosevelt are calling for more direct democracy, they're also including in their reforms sort of the early stages of campaign finance re reform, uh, transparency, you know, limitations on contributions and things like that. I just wondered if they were possibly right interconnected somehow. But Yeah, um, uh, so... so how would James Madison look at progressive reform? Let's, uh, I mean, well, that'll uh, this will be fun <laughs> that we're talking about because I mean, it, it can be looked at like this. Um, the railways are a minority, easily outvoted. Um, they, uh, they probably can't control most of any state legislature. Um, they can be outvoted when their uh, stuff comes up. Uh, they're a monopoly of some sort, but nevertheless, the number of people connected to that monopoly isn't that large. So what, what is the reform? The reform is a majority faction made up of all people who'd like to pay a lot less for their, ra for their railroad services. And so they are voting for uh, limiting their own costs when it comes to the railways. So there was a book uh, written uh, called Enterprise Denied about the railway history of the, um, I, can't, I can't remember when it was written, but it goes up to 1920. And it just goes through the various decisions uh, made by both state commissions and the national commissions against railways. And they always found in favor of the farmers, who was a majority, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and those who wanted to use the railways so that they would have cheaper transportation costs that is like every other industry. So one way to look at what ended up happening with respect to railways is that railways were a minority, they were outvoted, a majority faction ended up expropriating the minority, dictating lower prices to the minority, and frankly, putting them out of business and into receivership, uh, which they were by 1920, um, they were denied the ability to, um, to reinvest in their own companies because that was thought to be excess profit. And uh, the very dynamic industry of the 19, early 1900s became Amtrak uh, by 1925. And, uh, and uh, as I say, under federal control. So, I mean, I think that's a Madisonian analysis of what the progressives are actually uh, trying to accomplish. And um, in order to kind of justify uh, the removal of rights from the minority, Madison would argue, uh, demagogues are creating this claim of special privilege and special interests. Um, and, but they really want just lower prices for themselves and their constituents. And what is TR doing? TR is stirring up the people with claims of hidden oligarchy uh, and, uh, and trying to rally them uh, with their immediate interests in order to undermine this particular industry. I mean, I think that would be a Madisonian analysis of what, uh, what the progressives <laughs> are doing here. I'm not endorsing it, um, but I'm also like not easily dismissing it. There's, there's actual evidence for this. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I have to ask at this point, so this, this Theodore Roosevelt that we're discussing uh, this is the 1910, 1912 Roosevelt that we're reading, right? 
is um is this a new roosevelt i it's a slightly off the flow of the conversation but this always comes up is this with the real theodore roosevelt real you know please stand up uh is this the roosevelt of 10 years earlier or is something changed in his rhetoric and how he thinks about um democratic rule and these sorts of things any thoughts on this let me just start us off there because there's there's so many threads so many rich threads of, of roosevelt's speeches one thread that we haven't really talked about a whole lot yet and we could certainly put on the table is his national versus state power thread i mean that really comes through he said look we're at we're, we're, we have national problems that can't be really resolved fully at the state level and so there's he's, he's expanding national government power to deal with things that's one thread a second thread is what we might call separation of powers and institutional reforms that could be adopted either the state level or the federal level. And this is the more direct representation of a public opinion thread where he's calling for, let's have a direct primary, let's have the initiative process, let's have the recall process, let's have the uh, put judicial decision to a referendum. So I, did, I don't see a whole lot of that second thread come out in the earlier TR. But that first thread, the national power thread, that is present in, in, in Teddy Roosevelt. There's a speech that he doesn't get, it's, there's so many Teddy Roosevelt speeches, but there's a speech in 1906 where he goes to dedicate a new state capital in, in Pennsylvania. And he goes up there and he talks about, and, and much of the, the national parts of this new nationalism speech that he gives in 1910 were already present or foreshadowed several years later while he's president. And as he's president, he's saying, look, we have had to, 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 the national government has had to take on more responsibility because states weren't able to do what they needed to do in that sense. And so in some ways, the, the new national speech is, it goes a little further in that regard, but it's not a dramatic departure from that. So that seems more consistent in, in, in Roosevelt. And his simple point is, again, he says, look, um, we got a lot of issues out there to deal with um, for various reasons. Uh, states, they're not up to the task. And, um, and, and so it's, it's fallen to us. And, and look at my presidency, look at the various uh, kind of uh, pieces of legislation that we've passed. In some ways, in the speeches that we read, read here, he's continuing that theme just out of office. Yeah, and I would uh, add a third thread uh, that I think is also a novel thread, uh, EMTR. Uh, or at least it, it, it marks a difference in an early stage of his thinking and a later stage of his thinking. And that is the role of what we call administration or, um, or you know, the rule of experts uh, in some way. And, uh, and I, as I understand it, uh, TR it was pretty self-conscious about having developed this idea in about 1906. Um, he uh, argued for the establishment of a Bureau of Corporations and uh, in a fine book, Gene Yarbrough, I can't remember the title of the book, that's why I was looking behind me, but I don't have it here. Um, it's in my office at, uh, at school. Uh, you know, I think she demonstrates that this thread of TR's um, uh, statesmanship uh, really came out after 1906. And you can see it in the New Nationalism speech. Uh, so the New Nationalism speech is given in 1910. The context for that is, you know, TR had gone to uh, Africa hunting animals and uh, had come back. And the question was whether or not he was gonna get back into politics. And it was like on the, on the newspapers. It was in the newspapers. You could surf the internet and, and never miss a tweet from TR on this matter, I think. And uh, so TR, um, uh, gives this speech in Kansas, and it's kind of his announcement that he's back and he's going to challenge uh, Taft uh, and his leadership, or at least try to rewin the Republican Party for his brand of progressive reform. And in that speech, uh, it comes up in two contexts. Um, there, for us, there are back-to-back -back paragraphs, um, and maybe it's a little more than a third of the way through. Uh, I'm going to focus on the second paragraph, but just to point both of them out. Um, uh, the, the first paragraph begins with the word combinations in industry are the result of an imperative economic law, which cannot be repealed by political legislation. Then he talks about the Bureau of Corporations, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Hepburn Act, which he helped pass in 1907. And, um, and, uh, and you know, that was the railway regulation stuff. And then 
he illustrates this in the next paragraph with a discussion of tariffs. And uh, this is also very interesting. Tariffs were long considered to be one of these um, uh, uh, locations of special interests so that uh, your boot makers would go to can uh, Congress and say, look, uh, if we're gonna have foreign competition from Canadian boots, we're gonna lose American jobs. So they would get uh, protection for the boot making industry from, uh, from congressional tariffs. And there was just a whole lot of tariffs. They were all over the place, excuse me. Uh, the tariffs were all over the place. And, uh, and, and there was a collective action problem. How can you get like everyone to agree that these tariffs are a bad idea? And they couldn't get everyone to agree that their idea, there was very little reform and the Republican party had always stood for tariffs. So why would it ever get, why would it ever undermine those tariffs? This is what we stand for. And uh, even if the conditions have changed and they're not needed anymore, this is what we're about. So this is a, and I, a part of that old establishment that had been around. And, uh, and, and in the, the next paragraph after he talks about the ICC and the Bureau of Corporations, the Hepburn Act, uh, near the end of that paragraph, the paragraph begins with the word, there is widespread belief among our people. Uh, let's look at that. Under the methods of making tariffs which have hitherto obtained, the special interests are too influential. Probably this is true of both the big special interests and the little special interests. These methods have put a premium on selfishness. And naturally the selfish big interests have gotten more than their smaller though equally selfish brothers. Here's the key part, I think, for our reflections. The duty of Congress is to provide a method by which the interests of the whole people shall be all that receives consideration. To this end, there must be an expert tariff commission, wholly removed from the possibility of political pressure or of improper business influence. End. That's a new thread in TR. It's this belief that there is some entity in our government which is like utterly selfless and able to be above the possibility of all political pressure and improper influence from anyone. And Congress needs to discover and empower this expert tariff commission to pass these laws. And, uh, and, and that commission must be actually empowered to, to cut tariffs. In other words, to take political power and uh, exercise it apart from public pressure. And, uh, and that's a big time difference from the early TR and really from all uh, previous American constitutional practice. Um, uh, what's the alternative to this? I mean, it's good to think about what the alternative to it is. And, uh, and maybe we can talk about that. I don't wanna take up uh, all, all the air here. <laughs> No, no, I've never noticed that before, Scott. I never noticed that because um, <clears throat> in that, in what he's calling for here, he reminds me a little bit more of the sort of Woodrow Wilson type progressive that puts a lot more emphasis in his writings about the need for um, a, a, a level of apolitical, right, unbiased um, administrative experts who are wholly removed. And in fact, you know, building a, with a barrier between them um, and, and public opinion and business influence and things like this. He's starting to sound a little bit like that Wilsonian idea here of, of administrative, apolitical administrative expertise. I may be stretching it, but I, I never noticed that before. So, um, I mean, look at the previous paragraph. We have a right to expect from the Bureau of Corporations and from the Interstate Commerce Commission a yeah. very high grade of public service. Hmm. You should be as sure of the proper conduct of the interstate railways and the proper management of interstate businesses as we are now sure of the co conduct and management of our national banks, the Fed. Uh, and we should have as effective supervision in one case as in the other. So, you know, and he wants to go beyond what has been done in that particular case. So I think that's, um, I mean, what Gene Yarbo does in that book is really show that that is, there's this uh, uh, road to Damascus moment for uh, TR in 1906 uh, during that election uh, cycle. I don't know that that's when we get this particular picture, one of my favorite TR pictures. Um, this is from the American progressivism reader of Addo and Pastrito, but you know, he looks like he's enjoying himself. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, Scott and John, you're both bringing up such great points. So um, before we continue, I wanna just remind people joining us, feel free to submit 
any questions at all that you'd like uh, these two very thoughtful scholars to to address. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to push back just based on some of the things you've said. I'm going to uh, Scott, for example, earlier you said, you know, maybe that the um, the extent to which legislatures, including state, le especially state legislatures, had been captured by business interests was overstated by progressives. Um, I, I wonder if the kinds of direct democracy reforms, democratic reforms that the progressives like Roosevelt are calling are really would really be that effective, even even with cooperative sort of progressive legislatures. Um, and for, for two reasons. Uh, well, first of all, as you both noted, um, a lot of these are uh, democratic reforms are, are aimed at the state level. And a lot of states incorporate these things, right? I know I'm in Ohio, we do, we have recall, we have the recall power of the, the initiative and the referendum, but they're very, very rarely used. Now the, the recall can be, you know, big time, of big time importance. And that, that has gotten some, you know, particular highlights uh, in politics over the last, you know, 30, 40 years to be sure. But the, uh, and I'm trying to remember in Ohio, the last significant use of initiative may have been the, um, to ban smoking indoors. And I don't even remember how, that was 20 years ago, maybe, or something like that. But my, but so, I, so, you know, it seems like we have these reforms now in place, but, but people uh, don't <laughs> take advantage of them the way maybe Theodore Roosevelt was hoping they would. John, yeah, just go ahead. Well, I, I guess I want to- um, Maybe Ohio is the, 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 not the best case, but <laughs> go well, ahead. Well, let me, let me say this because I think this is a, for, for teaching purposes and obviously for discussion purposes, one way to take, if you're, if you were assigning some of Teddy Roosevelt is to say, well, look at these institutions that were created that came out of the progressive era. Did they, are they working as intended? Do they achieve their goals? So I think that's a great way to take the conversation for us. It's a great way for a classroom to take the conversation. <laughs> Here's, let, let me suggest some ways in which actually direct democracy is, and the initial process is achieving its goals today. So um, marijuana legalization. Uh, there is a big gap between public opinion on marijuana legalization and the public opinion of legislators. The first five states that legalized medical marijuana in the 1990s, it all took place through the initiative process. California led off and a few other states. It wasn't until Hawaii, about five years after all the other states had gone, that the legislature finally said, okay, we're on board with this. But even so today, if we look at medical marijuana and recreational <laughs> marijuana in the states that have it, about half of the times where states have taken that step, it's been done through direct democracy because the legislatures in those states weren't willing to do so. Let me give another example. Minimum wage increases. Uh, there are, uh, the federal minimum wage is still 725 an hour, but states can set a higher minimum wage. There are a number of states, mostly controlled by Republican uh, 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 state legislature and governors where the minimum wage remains at 725. There are uh, about half the states or more that have actually set a minimum wage higher than 725. In a majority of the states where it's been set higher, it's been done through the initiative process, their direct democracy. And in fact, since 2000, there's been 20 times that a minimum wage measure has been put to the ballot through the people through direct democracy. And it's one every single time. We, we have to go back to the 1990s to find a time. You know, maybe at some point this will, somebody will propose a $50 minimum wage and the people finally say no. But so far, the people have always wanted to say yes. I put those examples, and I could put a few other examples in there too. Medicaid expansion. Um, in the last few years, the numbers that Amer the Affordable Care Act gives states a choice do you want to expand Medicaid? A number of state legislatures said yes early on, and then it stalled around 2015 half dozen states where the legislature said we're not ready to expand Medicaid, they put it to a direct vote of the people, actually in states such as Nebraska, Missouri, Oklahoma, and it's passed. I say that because now one can say, well, maybe the legislature were right in each of those cases to stand in the way. Maybe there is a problem with raising the minimum wage so high. Maybe marijuana legalization sounds good, but it has you know consequences that, that, that we should take more account of. But it does seem that the actual the effects of the initiative process are in some ways quite significant on some issues. And I think in this way, we go back to Roosevelt uh, in some of his speeches. 
notice how he's kind of carefully puts puts his endorsement for initiative processes. He says, I'm not saying that we would use the initiative process all the time. I'm not saying that we would replace the legislature, but he's saying in of cases where the legislature really is not fully responsive or representative of public opinion, I would be open to that. I would say in that sense, direct democracy is fulfilling that that expectation in some states. As, as Chris, as you know, there's 24 states that have the initiative process in some fashion or another. Um, some of those states use it quite frequently. Oregon, Arizona, Colorado, California. Others use it much more infrequently, and Ohio would be one of the less frequent states to use it. So it, so it ranges widely, but if we have some participants here from, uh, from some of the Western states in particular, west of the Mississippi, I expect some folks would say, um, let me tell you, um, let, let me give some examples of how direct democracy is, is, is consequential for government. Great points, great points. Yeah, um, so, but but what is what are these direct democratic mechanisms? Are they capturable by special interests? Yeah. Um, I mean, isn't it obvious that they are? And wasn't it obvious that they were then? And what's a special interest? Uh, so you can use all of those examples that you just gave there, John. I mean, who's behind medical marijuana reform? Pot growers. And who gets outspent in those initiatives? I mean, always those who oppose the, 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 the referendum. Here in Idaho, we had a Medicaid expansion that passed uh, through an through a initiative. And the, those who opposed the expansion were outspent 50 to one. Who's in favor of it? The hospitals, whose profits go up when they get more, um, more you know, uh, patients who are being subsidized by the government. So, you know, to me, the, the biggest claim, the biggest and most problematic claim that TR and Wilson uh, make is that there is this sphere of like public spirited deliberation above politics, where the people just kind of spontaneously express the popular will and their desires. And, and then maybe uh, experts who are also kind of immune from political um, considerations and pressure will like will execute the will of the the pure people who are never motivated by their interests but always by the public good and uh, you know the 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 sensible Madisonian idea I would say I'm calling it sensible but I'll just say the Madisonian idea is that there is never a sphere above politics it's all politics so so in every one of these cases like you can ask the people, do you favor medical marijuana? Do you favor legalization of marijuana? Maybe 70% say yes. Next question, do you, want, uh, do you want a lot of drug addicts in your community? 70% say no. Whoa, public opinion is confused on the question. And, uh, and then the, the way to handle uh, you know, a complex political organization isn't through one simple rule that you pass through popular vote, perhaps pu pushed by special interests, but rather by the deliberative concern of the legislature will try to balance all of the interests and concerns of, of, of the population. So, um, so I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going back to the Madisonian idea here, um, but I think the theoretical innovation of the progressives is the sphere above politics um, that manifests itself both in direct democracy and in the rule of experts. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that is really the basis for, uh, you know, like, uh, what's his name here? I've, I've just read him for the first time. So J. Allen Smith's critique of the founders is that they didn't believe in democracy. But what, what he really means by that is that they didn't believe in the purity of the people's goodwill. And, um, and, and since they were suspicious of that and thought that it wasn't a real basis for governing, they made a more complex government that had a lot of veto points within the government. So you had to get both the House and the Senate and the president and the judiciary kind of on board. And um, so anyways, I mean, that's, I think, a central yeah, issue. Go ahead, John. Let, 
Let me just, I was going to say, Scott's point just goes right into the question that appeared in the Q&A. And so let me kind of tie that together. So, so Dan in the Q&A says, well, how do the progressives, this is a classic question. I'm glad Dan put it. How do the progressives reconcile their kind of love for direct democracy with their love for expert governance? It's, it's a great question. It really is. Because in one sense, that, that seems to be a significant tension. Doesn't that seem the opposite? You are willing to allow the people to rule directly, but then you also, TR says, but I want these expert commissions. And I think Scott's point, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on Scott's point, because I think he in some ways answered that question. That put on the table. It, it comes, the best way to understand that is the progressives looked at legislatures and politics in general, of a boss rule and party machines as just a messy, messy business. And it was, it was kind of the, they saw what we see as compromise, they saw as corruption. What, 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 what could be seen as just kind of politicking in that sense of, uh, they saw as kind of machine boss rule in that way. And so if, if, you're, if, you, if you're unhappy with the kind of messiness of politics as it's played out in campaigning and in legislatures, you have two options. One, you go directly to the people and get the public interest. There's this idea, there's the public interest for the progressives that's out there independently of what's going on in, in the political sphere. I think I took Scott to be in some ways. Well, how do you get the public interest reflected if it's not being reflected in legislatures and ordinary politicking? You need to go directly to the people to get the public interest reflected purely there, or you go to these experts that are above everything. And so that's how I would, one way that I would reconcile what otherwise seems to be a tension within the progressive thought. But I don't know if Scott has some, some, some further kind of thoughts on this classic tension of this preference for direct democracy at the same time as expert rule. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with the, uh, the way you put it. I mean, <clears throat> When, when TR talks about uh, the establishment of the Tariff Commission, <clears throat> he says uh, that it's the duty of Congress to provide a method by which the interests of the whole people shall all receive consideration. But like, the point he is making is that no congressman can do that. Every congressman is kind of beholden to a local interest. Therefore, the whole people are never deliberating about what is going on. It's always people very much tied to a local constituency with their peculiar interests and uh, concerns. So what needs to be done is a new nationalism needs to arise. That is, there needs to be a way of capturing the thoughts of what the whole people are, um, are, are involved with. And his idea here, I think, is primaries and other ways of, uh, of bypassing party apparatus uh, in order for uh, candidates to be selected directly by the people. The hope being that the more primaries there are, the more um, the general will of the people will be expressed through these individuals. Um, and at the state level, you know, we can bypass those uh, le state legislative interests with initiatives and uh, and referenda. So um, so yes, I very much think that these things are connected to the idea that uh, that there is a sphere uh, beyond politics or above politics or trans political sphere. The people will express their desire. That's apolitical, and then the experts will achieve their desire. That's apolitical. Right. But doesn't it start it, look the, the success of this this vision or the scheme that you're that you're both laying out here? It, it it depends on two things, it seems to me. One is that you can actually get apolitical experts, <laughs> administrative experts, you know, who really are apolitical. Uh, they are, after all, human beings, right? Which well, some of them are. And uh, and the other and the other problem is how do you how do you know that they're actually implementing the actual public will or the public interest and not just saying uh, you know that, that we somehow have this is what the public interest is this is what the public will is this is why we're what we're doing how do you keep them accountable I guess and I, I guess I'm channeling Madison here again as well here right how do you keep those people accountable that's the frequent concern or, or criticism I hear about about this the scheme that's being laid out here is there a way to keep them accountable 
Well, and let me just I'm pick up on leaning that. Into a, I'm leaning into another topic here, but okay. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. So. I'm going I'm to take, the, I'm take that in this direction, and, and, and we could talk about all kinds of expert agencies, such as, say, Environmental Protection Agency or the Federal Communication Commission. I want to just talk about something that's going on right now in politics, and that is how you draw district lines for uh, after each census. And so for most of, of American history, who draws up the congressional district lines, who draws up the legislative district lines, it's the legislature that does this. Well, that's fraught with all kinds of challenges, of course, because legislators themselves can be self-interested. And sometimes they're drawing the lines that they will be running in or lines that their party members will be running in. And so it's a very messy business and, and all kinds of compromises take place. Do you wanna take care of some incumbents? Um, is that a goal of incumbent protection? Do you want to have competitive elections? Do you want to help out one party? But that's the way it's been done. But in some ways, the progressive spirit can be seen as embodied in the movement over the last few decades to have district lines drawn by independent commissions. And so California, Arizona, Ohio this year, as, as well as other states, who's drawing up those legislative and congressional district lines? It's not the legislature in that messy business doing so. It's this independent commission. It's this search for something that's going to be apolitical. Well, um, when, when folks have looked at this and they say, well, how do these commissions actually work? Are they really apolitical? And do, do they, are, they, are they completely um, kind of uh, uh, free of political pressure and their own views? Well, that, the jury's out on that, to say the very least. Because who ends up, the first question is, well, how do you get selected for these commissions? Um, and who wants to run on these commissions? Oftentimes it's not, the people who do are very intensely interested in the political outcome, very much enmeshed in politics and very much kind of concerned about what party does well. So we could talk about this same question that you raised, Chris, in the sense of environmental regulation or, or Federal Communication Commission or other things. But I just wanted to kind of take it to a very real kind of um, uh, uh, practical thing because we're just we're just now, um, a lot of states have completed their redistricting and some other states are still going on. Ohio is still still going on. Gosh, as we I was going to say, yeah, have you, see, have you seen what's going on in Ohio? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's, that, that, that could take us the rest of, the, uh, of, of this webinar if we wanted to kind of talk about that. But so <laughs> I, I want to just play off of Chris's point in that sense is, is, is we see a, in a very real way this search for something apolitical, um, less messy, less kind of tied in with particular interests. It's really difficult really difficult, if not impossible, to really secure individuals who are going to be completely objective, if we put that word, completely uh, disconnected from partisan interests or certain views, who these particular interests who are gonna embody this public interest more so than other people. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yep, no doubt. I mean, that's the Madisonian critique of, uh, of the expert thing and, um, and uh, so, like, what do you do? Yeah, like, what, what does a tariff commission do? Uh, using that that same thing, well, what does a tariff commission do? Well, <laughs> it tries to figure out where we don't need tariffs, and um, and and then they propose they propose a lot of reductions in tariffs, and then like, all right, well, that's good. Well, that's a very political event, and uh, and then every congressman goes, you can't take away my tariff. Uh, darn it. And, um, and, and, but, but even, even when they're deliberating about when, what you need a tariff, they take evidence from whom do they take evidence? Well, the people who are very much interested in whether or not the tariff should go down. And, um, you know, uh, I think the kind of, uh, you know, what, what they would do in the tariff commission is that they would just, they would have the experts reduce tariff schedules and, uh, and without having a vote in Congress over whether or not they would be approved. Like, that's a big deal um, because tariffs are not just about protection. They're also about government revenue. And when you reduce tariffs, which they did, now you need a new source of government revenue. So after the tariff commission was established in uh, the Wilson administration, it took like three years before the income tax amendment was made. And uh, those things are related. And what like Congress wasn't involved in, the, in some ways in the first question, uh, but it very much had to then get involved in the second question. And, uh, and what the commission did, uh, you know, had a big time effect. And like, 
here's the way to look at it. This is what Federalist 12 is about. Hamilton wrote Federalist 12 on why we need a national government to collect revenue. And his argument there was, well, we don't want to have a big apparatus co collecting revenue. The best way to keep a small apparatus for collecting revenue is to have tariffs where you just need a custom house. And uh, the goods have to flow through the custom house. There's uh, specific locations where the goods have to go. Um, otherwise, you'd have to like, have this really, really uh, intrusive apparatus to collect sales taxes or income taxes. So like, yeah. as a result like... of the establishment <laughs> of the tariff commission, you get the IRS. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't like you don't no one's thinking about that while they're on the tariff commission because their mm -hmm. mandate is very narrow and they're not thinking about the long term effects of whatever decisions they're making uh, will be. And uh, I'm not saying Congress would be perfect on that, but it's good to have the consent of the people to such important long term changes. I think, John, Scott, that's a, such a great point, because by trying not to be political, they are in, in many cases ignoring political consequences, right? Consequences exist and affect people in the political realm. So, and again, this is the other critique of people on commissions is that they're so, and especially once they become uh, sort of, you know, institutionalized and bureaucratized and people working for these institutions, uh, um, uh, you know, their, their, their careers, uh, you know, they spend their whole careers in these things that they somehow live outside of the, of the sort of real political world that the rest of us live in. Anyway, I've heard that 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 um, yeah that complaint as well. John, you, did you want to? Yeah, please go right ahead, John. Well, I just wanted to take us. There's there's so many threads that we could pursue, and and one thread that we raised briefly, and I just want to put it on the table for possibly coming back to, is in the progressives' view of the Constitution in that way, and this comes up in J. Allen Smith in particular. And let me just kind of say these remarks to put it on the table for discussion. So we often are familiar with, we teach and we read Charles Beard. And he's seen as, as, as a crucial figure in looking back with a, a, a microscope on the working of the Constitutional Convention and showing us uh, uh, what was really going on and what was really driving the convention in that way. But actually, Charles Beard's uh, kind of critique and his main critique is published after J. Allen Smith. In some ways, you can see, for those of you who are more familiar with Charles Beard than J. Allen Smith, um, you can see that actually Smith was there kind of first in some ways. And, 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 and I, I raise that to, to, to make this point, that one of the real key developments with the progressive era was their willingness to critique in a fundamental way the U.S. Constitution and the drafting of it. Had there been movements before in American history where folks were willing to kind of really take a critical eye at the Constitution? The anti-slavery movement did to, to some degree, certainly. They said, look, this is a flawed document to some degree. Some folks in that movement were willing to say it, it, because of some of the, 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 uh, the pro-slavery uh, uh, kind of compromises that, that they saw in it. But none of that rose to the level of what the progressives and some progressive officials were willing to do, especially kind of leading officials with a progressive air. And to really say, and Smith is like that, if you have the view of the Constitutional Convention, the founding as Smith does, you wouldn't want to kind of keep around many of the institutions that were created by such a, by such a group. You would see it as fundamentally flawed. And so in some ways, I thought that the order of the readings that we had, we had Smith and then Teddy Roosevelt, it was a very nice order because in some ways Smith can be seen as preparatory for some of the other progressives is to say, because if, if you have a, a, a favorable view of the founding, the convention and view that is motivated by kind of public spiritedness, you're, you're going to be more open to kind of considering the institutions and the document that emerge out of there. But if you take Smith's point of view, that look, this was just the rich, well-off, influential folks that got a hold of that constitutional convention. And they basically allowed a little bit of public representation, but just as much as they had to allow. If that's your view of the constitution and the constitutional convention, the founding, you're much more open to some radical changes and radical views. So I just want to put that on, on the table. That's an important thread that comes through in, in, in the progressive era. And it comes through very much through in J. Allen Smith. This is a flawed founding. We need to uh, fundamentally reassess what was created out of there. Yeah, I think that's really interesting uh, uh, as, a as a kind of contrast to, I mean, 
J. Allen Smith and other, there were others who were quite openly critical, pretty strongly critical of the founding. Roosevelt tended to couch his criticisms in, um, I don't know, backhanded compliments or something like that. But he, he, and even Woodrow Wilson, right, would, would, would find a way. So uh, yeah, this article uh, that you recommended, this piece by Jalen Smith, I hadn't read either. I heard Scott say earlier he was uh, taking a look, had taken a look at this. Um, I hadn't read it either. I was really um, surprised by the candor, uh, which I'm not used to sometimes from from progressives when they're dishing out their criticisms of the founding. But it, but you also remind me, by the way, John, you mentioned earlier the um, when we were talking about. A, a lot of the the purpose of a lot of these democratic reforms was to pressure uh, state legislatures. But you also mentioned the the courts became a roadblock, right? Ultimately, so it really kind of becomes a question of let, we can put pressure on the legislatures, but 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 how do how do the courts play into the into a democracy? Right? I'm not asking the question the right way. It's it's connected to the to the Smith uh, idea here, the the Smith thesis. It, if can, can the courts be obstacles to democracy? Yes, yes. And how do you deal with the courts, right? So, yes, yes. And, and let me let me just pick up on there because so many rich threads in here. And let's talk about courts because that really does in Teddy Roosevelt's The Right of the People to Rule. You would say actually the courts are some of his key um, uh, institutional concern in that way. Yeah, he's concerned about legislatures. Yes, he's concerned about party bosses and machines in his view. But he's really concerned about the courts. And let me say what was put on the table in this era, and then let's also say what, what kind of emerged out of there. So there was some real dissatisfaction that who are these judges and by what right do they stand in the way of the popular will? And so in some levels, there really comes to be as like, should, should courts even be independent in, in that way? But then in the more moderate forms, and this is where Roosevelt is, is, is putting forward a more moderate form, he says, well, Let's, let's actually tweak the role of the courts. Um, one thing that was done in some of these state courts was they said, look, at the least, let's not allow a bare majority of a court to strike down an act that passed through the legislature signed by the governor. And so three states in the progressive era passed supermajority rules for exercising judicial review. So Nebraska, North Dakota, and Ohio actually pass a law that says it's not enough for a state Supreme Court to strike down a state law just by a bare majority. It has to be by five of seven votes or four of five votes. Wow. North Dakota and Nebraska have retained those provisions. Ohio got rid of its in 1968 eventually. But that's a that's a very real practical embodiment. Okay, we're fine with judicial review, but let's let's um, uh, let's let's allow it to be susceptible to these reforms. And then the recall of judges was put in place in, in say 19 states have a recall of judicial officials in some fashion mm. about two-thirds of those states applied that to judges and that was the big deal most people say oh i'm definitely okay with recalling a governor definitely okay with recalling a legislature somebody said but recalling a judge and this is what actually got Arizona uh, held up its bid for statehood. Arizona put in its initial constitution 1911 a recall provision they applied to judges and so President Taft says, I'm vetoing that. He said, that goes against fundamentally our understanding <laughs> of public government. And so he said, you need to take that out. So the people of Arizona took it out of their original constitution, uh, resubmitted their petition, got statehood, and promptly the next election put back in the recall of judges, <laughs> and, which it retains to the day. So, huh. so I got into some into the weeds there, into some details of Chris's great point, but in that sense, but I just wanted to get on some practical ways that they were really intensely thinking about how do we make the courts work in tandem with democracy as they viewed it, rather than as an obstacle to it. That's you know, very interesting. It strikes me about the Smith piece, and I think this relates directly to the court issue is it would be interesting to ask Smith whether democracy has any drawbacks um, because he like criticizes the founders for their opposition to direct democracy. And he does it in the name of, you know, they wanted government that would be stable. They wanted government that would be wiser. Uh, they wanted government that would be more uh, deliberative and and I think they would like, agree with all of that. Like the reason that we're opposed to direct democracy is because we would like more stability. And the courts are actually one of the anchors
chapters of the Constitution that provide a stable understanding of what our fundamental law is. And, uh, and uh, the, the same goes with the indirect modes of election. Um, so that instead of having legislation being made by people directly, it's made by legislatures who are elected by the people. Um, the same would be true of, uh, uh, you know, let's just limit ourselves to that. So, uh, so like they had, the founders had a criticism of democracy, direct democracy, not Republican government, not popular government, but direct government uh, where the people rule directly because they thought that the people would tend to be blown about by sudden breezes of passion. And if the people ruled directly, we would be encouraging uh, demagogic uh, statesmen, not statesmen, politicians, uh, to appeal to the people's base or passions, to their envy, to their uh, hatred of elites, to their desire to expropriate uh, those who had property. And, uh, and you know, and that would undermine the stability and long-term interests of the country. When you look at Smith's argument, you wonder if there's any color at all in what the founders had reservations about when it came to direct democracy, because um, he overstates their criticism of democracy and uh, of popular government, equates the two. And uh, set, since they criticized uh, democracy, they must criticize popular government. And then, you know, puts forward this new understanding of democracy, which will just empower the people to rule directly. Does he think there are any circumstances in which there might be some color uh, to, the, uh, to the founders' reservations about direct democracy? And if so, how would Smith put those reservations into actual policies or practices? I think at least like TR, pays lip service to possible reservations about uh, democracy. Like only when you have really public spirited leaders like me uh, will anything like this work. And um, whereas Smith seems to just suggest like this is gonna be kind of an unproblematic transition. And, okay. um, and to me, that's like the ultimate uh, problem with, uh, with Smith's criticisms. I mean. Most of the things he says are true, but rather uncharitable uh, uh, when it comes to understanding <laughs> the founders. Um, but the ultimate issue is that he like doesn't give any color to any possibility that uh, direct democracy would cause problems. Yeah, hey, I, yeah, please, John. Yeah, jump in. Well, I just I saw another question come up in the Q and A, and I'm always glad when when questions come up here. And, and so that so Dan had another question for us, and, and he was picking up on the judges' point. He said, "Well, what would be the views of the of the progressives on how to select judges?" And and that's a great question. They certainly the progressives certainly wanted the judges on a tight leash. I guess that's the way to put it. You're, you're, if you want a long leash where a public official has a lot of discretion to go around, you want a short leash, a tight leash, where the person, where the, the public official is very much uh, kind of responsive to. They certainly want a very much responsiveness in that way. Interesting enough, by the time the progressive era is coming, this the dominant mode of selecting judges at the state level at the time was by direct partisan election. So, and in fact, even today, um, in 38 of the 50 states, judges are elected in some fashion. Now, in th that ranges. Sometimes in, in about seven states, the judges are elected on a party label. Like, I'm the Democrat running for judge in North Carolina. Somebody says, no, I'm the Republican running for judge in North Carolina. And that you have a face-off just like any election. In a number of the states, it's a, it's a nonpartisan election where they just run. And, and it, it's not, um, you know, Smith versus Jones, R versus D, it's just Smith versus Jones. And then another group of states, they, they have what we call the Missouri plan or, or retention elections, where a judge is put on the bench and then after uh, periodically has to stand the voters have a chance, yes or no, keep this person on for another 10 years or eight years. Hmm. You're not running against anybody, you're just running against yourself. And they do. Well, the progressive era would very much have been supported that continuation of the uh, uh, of electing judges for the most part. Interesting enough, though, one other development, um, there was a bit of a, um, a, the, the American Bar Association lawyers at the time actually were pushing in an opposite direction. So up until that point, when they had judicial elections, it was all on a party label. 
beginning in 1912, you started to have a move for nonpartisan judges. And so this is going on in the progressive era from one wing of kind of intellectual thought. But the true progressives that we're reading here, they would have wanted kind of judges pretty much responsive to the popular will. And in that sense, at least it'd be able to recall them. I mean, probably as, notice Teddy Roosevelt says, he, he distinguishes between his view of the recall of judges and the referendum on judicial decisions. That's a fascinating thing. He says, look, I'm, I'm kind of for the recall of judges, but it's not, I'm not gonna go to the mat on that, you know, maybe in some sense not. And he distinguishes, he says, but one thing I really am for, and Taft was really against, he says, if a court hands down a decision and that decision is just way out of line with public opinion, I want the public to be able to say who was right in that. Was the legislature right in passing the law or is the court right in striking it down? He says, that seems unobjectionable to me. That's the true embodiment of the progressive <laughs> spirit towards judges. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I had always thought that uh, that uh, the uh, sort of popular review of judicial decisions would have been the, the more controversial of the two proposals. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, that's very interesting. So yeah, great questions from Dan, by the way, Carry, carrying the carrying the the weight today, huh? Uh, that's, those are two great questions. So we're at just about at the end of our time. And in fact, we're at the end of our time, and I didn't get to ask the one question I wanted to ask, but I don't want to keep you guys over. It would have it would have opened a, another can of worms, and I'll save it for another time when we're together. So, but gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for your thoughts. Uh, this was very informative. I learned a bunch, and I, I really appreciate it. So. Yeah, and Danita says, thanks for the uh, interesting perspectives on tariffs and the IRS. So a lot of great points today. Uh, very, very, very thoughtful. Thank you both very much. Um, so we'll wrap this up by saying, uh, just uh, remember that you'll get an email uh, soon with a link that you can request your certificate of participation. Um, check out other things that uh, TAH.org does. We have a lot of other resources available, um, other webinars, um, we're doing in-person seminars again. So, you know, check out the website and spread the word about the things that you that you like about what we're doing um, to your colleagues and friends, um, you know, on social media, however you can, however you can do that. It's always greatly appreciated. Our, our next Saturday webinar and our final one of the series, by the way, will be on May 14th and we'll be discussing the legacy of the progressives. And I think we'll be joined once again by the editor of the Ashbrook volume uh, on on progressives and populists, uh, Jason Jividen for that webinar. So take care until then, and I hope to see you at, at that next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks again for listening. You can learn more about our documents, programs, and resources for teachers and students at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org.